invite you, if, you'll, if you're looking for something maybe a little bit deeper than we talk about on Sundays, I would encourage you to come to our Wednesday night or one of our other midweek services. Um, would you like to know what other things we have? If you can get in contact with myself or Chuck or Pastor, or it's on the website as well. Um, but on Wednesday nights at 7, uh, Pastor has a, a Bible study that its purpose is to go um, deeper, and that's why it's called going deeper. <laughs> and uh, uh, also, uh, Pastor's been on a series talking about um, discipleship, the basics of Christianity, um, and uh, he'll, he'll be finishing up that series on Sunday. So I want to encourage you to come to that. If you if you missed any of it, it's all available online 24-7, so there's that. Uh, we've been talking about true rest, and last week, uh, if you remember, we talked about uh, the seven days of creation. We talked about how we're still in that seventh day, the seventh day of rest. And what that means is that at any time, um, we are able to come to God and He of His rest. And this is something that's talked about throughout the prophets, throughout the New Testament. Um, but... Uh, you know, the the idea of the day of rest was really foundational in Israelite culture. Um, it developed what was called the Sabbath from the day of rest. That was the one out of every seven days was dedicated uh, specifically to God. Um, and also, uh, they developed a tithe system that was based off the Sabbath as well. Except he actually required less on the tithe than he did on um, on the time. He only required a tenth of, um, of their income of their well-being, whereas he required a seventh of their days. So, um, the land had to have a Sabbath. The, you know, it was everything in, in their culture. Um, what I mean by the land having a Sabbath is every so often they had to have a, a piece of land not used. So, anyways, um, so, uh, tonight we're going to look at renewing your strength. When, when I was going through anxiety, people People through a bunch, well, I still go through anxiety all the time. In fact, I have it worse now than I did then, but now I'm just better equipped, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but when I first started going through anxiety, uh, people used to throw out a bunch of scriptures at me that I didn't really know what they meant. And they didn't really know what it meant either, but they would say it to me like it was supposed to have some special significance just from knowing the verse. Which, I mean, I'm, if that works for you, good for you, but I'm the kind of person that if something doesn't make sense, it's like, well, that does nothing. Right. I mean... It says in there, Judas went and hung himself. You could tell me that to one too. It's not going to have any effect on my life, though. You, you see what I mean? When you give someone a verse, you have to tell them the context. And so we're actually going to look at one of those uh, passages because it really goes hand in hand with the idea of, of finding the rest that we're looking for, that true rest. Um, so you can turn there. It's Isaiah chapter 40. Um, you, you know, when you get married, you don't get married and then not see each other until, until your retirement, right? I mean... There are things that happen between now and death, right? <laughs> I mean, there, there, are, there, are, there are those moments throughout our life, you know, raising the kids together or, you know, those fights that we have, you know, those things. There's things in between now and, and, and death. Uh, there's a lot of living between them. And, uh, but, you know, w with God, we kind of do the exact same thing. Oh, well, someday God's going to give us the rest in heaven. But until then, I'm just going to have to live miserable. What? <laughs> Don't you think that if God has eternal rest for us in heaven, that maybe he's got a little bit of sliver of something good here? John Eldridge put it like this. Where is the abundant life that God promised? And I think that that's just such, such a great idea there because in each of us, there's this part that kind of believes maybe we got shortchanged with our salvation. I think that this meme kind of really summarizes it very well. Congrats, you won a prize, and by a prize I mean nothing. And inside of us, there's, there's this little bit of nagging somewhere in each of us that maybe God isn't as good as, as he said he was. I mean, I want to believe that he's as good, and I want to believe that there's this rest and this joy, but I just have never seen it. So, I mean, maybe, maybe not so much. Um, okay, so I've asked God to forgive me, and, and I believe he has, so is there anything else in the, in the now? And if you look in Luke chapter 18, 29 through 30, or John 10, 10, he talks about this idea of, you know, it's not just for the next life, it's for now. Like John 10, 10, where he says, you will live life more abundantly. That's like now. 
And when he says, hey, if whosoever, you know, abandons their, their mother and father and brother for my sake, you know, it'll be rewarded to them in the next life and here too. You know, but somewhere along the line, we kind of lock that off and say, I have to live this miserable life and then get to heaven and then I'll be happy. But God has rest for us to enter into now. It starts at salvation, but it doesn't end there. God's got lots of things that he wants to do with our life. And he's got a joy that we don't even, we haven't even experienced yet. He's got a peace that goes beyond our understanding. And on that note, he's also got rest for us. So Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable or unsearchable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Okay, what do I have to do for that? What do I have to do for this whole eagle thing? This sounds good. This sounds like, you know, living above my problems. This sounds like living in joy. But let's do that. Where's the sign-up sheet? Uh, but then somewhere it's like, well, so what does that actually mean? How do I get from here to, to there? You know, and so we see this, this, this divide. There is this rest that God promises over there somewhere, and here we are over here somewhere, and we just think, well, I have no, I have no idea how to get to there. So I guess we're just going to have to wait till heaven, and I'll just stumble my way through life. But that's not really the way that God intended for it. Um, but there are some, th some very stupid things that we believe that keep us from rest. And I think that if we don't look at those things, we're not going to be able to really look at how to do this thing, this Isaiah 40 thing. This thing that we're looking at, how to find that renewed strength bit, if we don't look at this. Um, I'm sorry, buddy, it's, it's not working. The light's on, but nobody's home. Oh, never mind, it's going. Um, the first thing, uh, I deserve more. The second thing, you or God, whichever one, owes me. The third thing, I don't have to do or live as God said. And the last thing, God is not as good as he said. These ideas just kind of creep into our minds, and we don't even realize that, that we have these ideas, but they're rattling around in our head, and they just kind of make a home there. I deserve more. You know, this, God, this, I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I just deserve more from this life. I deserve from what's going, more from this life. So we go on this eternal quest of trying to get what's owed us because we deserve more. Why did you divorce your spouse? Because I deserve more. Why, why, did, why, did you, why did you not do this? Why did you do this? Because I deserve more. People can't treat me like that. Do you realize that the majority of, of Christian problems are due from a Christian not wanting to be treated like Jesus himself was treated? Yeah, that's true. You or God owes me. God, I don't deserve this. You owe me something better. I don't have to do as God said. I can live my life my way on my terms. The last one, God is not as good as he said. You know, okay, yeah, he said that he's real good. That's fine. But here in the real world. See what I mean? And so we kind of start believing these, these ideas. And as long as we start believing those ideas, we're never going to be able to find that rest that we're searching for. So in just a real quick recap on Isaiah chapter 40, um, to kind of walk us into this verse that we're looking at, at verses 37, I'm sorry, 27 through 31. So that, uh, what's happening before in the chapter? Because remember, if you, don't, if you don't read what's around the verse, um, you're not going to get the verse. Now, it really doesn't do us too well to read after verse 31 because that takes us into chapter 41. And if you know anything about the books of prophecy, they're not really arranged in any specific order, like chronological or anything. They're just kind of grouped together and maybe some main ideas, but not really going to help you because it's a completely different prophecy. So we don't want to look at chapter 41 because it's a different prophecy. Well, instead, we want to split back a few verses and kind of see what's going on in this, in this prophecy. So it starts out in verses 1 and 2. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity has been removed. So 
Well, let me just kind of give you a recap. Jerusalem wasn't going wasn't to be destroyed until uh, 586 B.C. Now, Isaiah prophesied way before that. Isaiah was prophesying at a time when Jerusalem wasn't even in danger of falling. And so Israel, the northern kingdom, fell. And, is, and Judah, Jerusalem, the, the, the southern part, still didn't fall. For a hundred and some odd years it didn't fall. And then it would fall, and then they would come back. So Isaiah is prophesying about them coming back when they haven't even left in the first place. So we're talking about him prophesying so far in advance that they're probably thinking, Isaiah, what are you smoking? Are you crazy? We're doing fine, buddy. We're doing fine. And uh, so the, so here he, he starts out the same come from my people. So okay, yes, Babylon, which is the power, world power at the time to destroy Jerusalem, they, they, they would conquer Judah. They would conquer Jerusalem. But, and, and although that was a big problem for, for obviously for them, God gave hope before it ever happened. That's an amazing idea. Here he's saying, yes, there's this terrible thing that's going to happen to you. Absolutely, it's, it's going to be bad and it's going to happen. But then he starts giving them comfort for when, they, when, it's, when it finishes before it even began. Think of, think of as if God said something like this. Isaiah. I'm going to use you as an example, okay? Uh, okay, so you've made me mad. You're going to have cancer in about 20 years. Okay. Now, let's say I go to you the next day and say, oh, yeah, by the way, after you struggle with cancer for seven, for, for seven years, uh, then I'm going to come and I'm going to completely heal you and you're going to be totally fine. You're going to die in perfect health. Like, what are you talking about, God? This is so far off into the future. Like, what? And that's exactly what we have going on here. So, okay. Uh, Babylon would destroy Judah, but God, God's giving them hope. And you know the thing is, God did the exact same thing with us. He gave us hope for what would happen before it ever happened. He told us that our families would abandon us. He told us that things wouldn't go great with the government. He told us that all these things would happen long, long time ago. It shouldn't be a surprise to us. I mean, the, the Bible was, began to be written 3,400 years ago. And it was finished 2,000 years ago. I think that maybe we missed. <laughs> we missed it. God told us, yes, these bad things are going to happen, but he gave us comfort before it ever happened, too. So part of, part of finding rest, I will say this, is listening to God. And if you're not reading your Bible, you really aren't listening to God. So verses 3 through 5, after that, he talks about um, Basically, how they need to prepare for it because God is going to show up and things won't always be like they are. If you look there, a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will be seen. I'm sorry, we'll see it together for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. So here we see a few things. First off, prepare for it. God's going to do something to prepare for it. The second thing that we see in, in this section here, God is going to show up, and things won't always be like they are. When we're going through problems, that's the first thing we say. Things are always going to be like this. And we just throw hope out the door because there's no chance of anything ever changing. Or we go to the other extreme, and we give ourselves a bunch of false hope. Tonight's going to be the night that everything turns around. All my kids are going <laughs> to repent, and... There's going to be rainbows in the sky, and man, oh man, I'm, I'm going to get $10,000 in a check from the government. I mean, everything's going to go great. Well, you know, there's a difference between false hope and reality. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't have to lie to yourself. But with that being said, yes, God is doing something, and God will continue to do something because God is not a clockwork God. He doesn't set the clock in motion and just kind of sit back. He has been intimately involved with creation Ever since the beginning when his spirit was hovering over the waters. Ever since then, he's been intimately involved in the creation. And even more so us, more than any other animal or plant or piece of dirt on the entire planet. That's saying something. So this is what Paul, what, what, what Isaiah is saying. He's saying, okay, so I'm, I'm giving you hope for this bad thing that's going to happen. It won't always be bad. And then in verses 6, eight, eight, six through 8, he says this. Uh, a voice says, call out, then he's answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. Boy, that sounds real encouraging. 
The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. Well, I thought you were supposed to be encouraging me here, God. Well, now we get to verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. In other words, the thing that I've said is not going to pass away. I will remember it. It will come to pass because I said it was going to come to pass. Though everything around you is dead and decaying, my word will endure. What I said will happen will happen. That's a pretty powerful statement when you – because how many times have you woken up and you realized – you know, I'm getting older. Things aren't working like they should be working here, guys. I've got real bad arthritis in my hand, which, by the way, playing guitar, I go, man, it's a beast. But anyways, with that being said, I, I, I know that, that I'm going to die one day. But what I do know more than that is that God, his word will endure. So then we see in verses 9 through 11, uh, basically, I'm not going to read it all, but summarizing here, God cares for us. He rewards us here and, and in heaven. He will comfort us. He will guide us. He didn't abandon us, and he, even in our punishment, he doesn't abandon us. You can read through chapter 40 yourself, but there's a lot of great stuff there. In, ver in verses 12 through 26, he talks about basically how he's able, how he's powerful, and how he is in control. Did you know that God's in control? Yes. Did you know that? It's okay. Whatever's going on, like, it's all right. Sometimes we're so afraid to let go of something, we're afraid that maybe we'll have an aneurysm if we just lighten up a little bit. It's okay. God's got it. Really, he does. He doesn't need our constant interjection to have things covered. The idea of God having being in control means that there's never a moment when it slips out of his hands. So now, now we see this, okay? So, so chapter 40 in, in broad, he's talking about how things won't always be bad. God's going to work through it. How he will bring about the thing that he said. How he does care and he is able and all these things. And then that takes us to verse 27 and this starts to make a little more sense. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, or, you know, the nation that he's talking to, my way is hidden from the Lord, justice do me escapes, and notice my God. God doesn't care. Why do you say, God doesn't care? I just told you that he does, and I'm about to tell you even more so what's going to happen. I'm not a God that's going to answer you one day. I'm a God now that if you wait on the Lord, I will renew your strength. Well, see, now that's a little bit different. See, now he's saying something different entirely. Before he was saying... I will bring something bad in the future, and then I will see you through at the end of it. Now he's saying something else. He said, in the meantime, I will renew your strength. That's something entirely different. That's not, when you get back from your exile for 70 years, I'm going to renew your strength then. Because most of these people, these people are going to be dead by then. What does that matter to them? He's talking to people hundreds of years before it happens, and he says, I will renew your strength. So now we have something a little bit more profound. So to the statement, I deserve more, God doesn't care, we see that that's an outright, um, an outright line. So just a little bit of a summary of what I said um, earlier. Prepare for it because God will show up and things won't always be like this. So in verse 27, we have the idea that, oh, God doesn't really care. Now in verse 28, we find something a little more profound. You can tell that Israel is at the point where they're not real familiar with God anymore. Look at verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of, all, of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is unsearchable or inscrutable, depending on what translation. Now, see, that doesn't, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But back in the day, they believed that gods did get tired. They believed that they weren't all knowing, that they weren't all powerful. Gods oftentimes got in fights with each other, and they would hide stuff from each other. You could hide something from your god, for instance. Uh, where they would be unaware of it. Um, they would get tired. They were prone to, to weakness. To, they needed to eat. Uh, all kinds of different stuff like that. So they did believe that. But here we have God saying, I'm not like them. I'm something else. Do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, Yahweh? Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is unsearchable. He knows what's going on, man. So in verse 29, it says, He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. So, okay. He pays attention to the weak. Okay, all right. This is good, because I kind of feel like maybe I'm the weak person here, so this is starting to look good. So then we look in verse 30. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly. Um, now, I do want to kind of interject here again. The idea here is, you get tired, but I don't. It's kind of a contrast. He's contrasting himself with them. But the idea here is overexhaustion. See, we don't really get that in, in the English 
because once again, translations are never precise. But what he's saying there here are though youths grow weary, although they become over exerted. Think of think of someone who's training. You ever been to football practice, right? Maybe some of you guys back when you were younger. Uh, you know, you sit there and you practice and you practice, and there comes a point when you overexert yourself and you just need to take a break for the day. You can't exercise anymore for that day. You know what I'm talking about? You start to get real shaky and you just can't lift any more weights. That kind of stuff. That is what he's talking about. He's talking about you who are overexerted, not you who are simply tired. Here's the difference. I woke up this morning, I didn't have coffee. I'm a little tired. That's not what he's talking about. I've been fighting this battle day after day after day. I am exhausted. I'm worn out. I've got nothing left to give. That's what he's talking about. Overexerted. Exhaustion. Gone to the point of struggling with something year after year after year, never seeing it get any better and only getting worse. That. That is what he's talking about. So just so that we understand the terms here, I, I, this, the translations are good, but they oftentimes miss things. Um, so God is always able to provide. But how? How do we get to that renewing strength that verse 31 is talking about? So let's, let's read 31 again. Yet those who wait for the Lord, okay, so waiting is clearly tied to this, will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run up and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Okay, all right. So there's a few things. First off, new strength. Some translations say, will renew your strength. That's very misleading. Um, the idea here is getting strength that you didn't have before. Uh, those of you who play video games, you know, your character has, like, action bars, and after you run out of energy, you, you know, your character doesn't have any more oomph, he doesn't have any more stamina attacks. Kind of that, okay? So think about that. And think about you get a second stamina bar. It's kind of like that, okay? So for those who don't play video games, think of you have no energy, and then God gives you a different energy, not your own, that takes the place of the energy that you don't have. So renewing your strength doesn't really cover it. The NASB kind of has a, a much better idea here. Um, they will gain a new strength. So that's that's quite a deal different. Okay, so we're not talking about simply getting pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and powering through. We're talking about something else. Okay, we're getting closer to figuring out how to get this new strength deal. So it's a strength they didn't have before. Okay, all right. And the effect is that they fly easily like eagles. And then once again, it's kind of lost in translations. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will mount up as easily as an eagle does, is basically the idea there. Um, once again, it really doesn't translate very well. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not, not, uh, not become weary. So the idea here is in all these different things, they're good. Flying with ease, running with ease, walking with ease, they're fine. So it obviously, or at least should be obvious, that he's not talking about physical. Did you know that? He's not, he's not talking about physical. He, he's not, God's not Red Bulls. He's not gonna give you, he's not gonna give you wings. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about, guys. <laughs> and he's not saying that, hey, you know, if you just wait on me, I'm gonna give you eternal stamina. It's gonna be like a fountain of youth, guys, like on the movies or something. It's not gonna be like that. This isn't, the, this isn't Marvel Comics. Uh, he's, he's talking about his spiritual, spiritual sustenance. So renew or new strength basically mean, it basically means the idea of a new strength that's not was not previously given. So let's just look at a few things in conclusion. The conclusion is gonna is gonna be the finale where we put all this stuff together. First off, to wait on the Lord means another translation you could do is trust in or hope in. So let's let's read it like that. Those who trust in the Lord will gain new strength. Those who hope in the Lord. So what does it mean to hope or trust in? Trust means to put your, your faith in something, you put your belief in something. Hope means like, everything around me looks like crap. I don't think this is ever going to get better, but my hope is in God because he's always in control. See the difference? Putting my hope in the devastation of the situation or putting my hope in God who makes all things new. Putting my hope in what I see, which is temporary and fading, or putting my hope in God, who does the impossible. You're going to put your hope in something. So the question is, what are you going to put it in? Um, so trusting kind of, it kind of, it's kind of waiting on the Lord can be summarized with two simple steps. The first is trusting, the second is acting. 
The trusting, that's the part where he miraculously renews us. The acting is the part where we allow ourselves to be renewed. Another way you could say that is, maybe trusting would be confidently believing or earnestly expecting. You know, like when you're waiting for the mailman and he's got your Amazon package and you're sitting there like a dog looking out the window. <laughs> you would say that you're earnestly expecting, right? You know it's coming. You looked online. It said that it was out for delivery. You know he's down there somewhere. It's going to get here. You're going to open that package. What? Don't tell me I'm the only one who gets excited for an Amazon package. Come on. Uh, but anyways, it, it's that earnestly expecting his promises since he is in control. So since God is in control, I am earnestly waiting for, waiting for his promises to be fulfilled. I'm waiting with expectation. With expectation. And then part two there, the acting part. So the first, that was the trusting part, the acting part. Not trying, um, listening to God's instruction and living in a way that honors him and makes him happy. Am I orienting my life for myself or for God? Well, how do you know if you're doing that? Well, reading the Bible is a really good place to start. If you don't know God, you're not going to know God. I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly simple there. Um, but I will say this, with all things said, I, yes, I did put it on. Feeling is dependent on action. If you want to feel God renew you, you have to be obedient in your action. If your belief goes no further than your brain, it's not a belief. A belief has to extend through your fingers. In other words, you need to put your hands where your mouth is. Do you know how you know if you really, really, really love your wife? If you stick with her, and if you stay faithful, and if you keep encouraging her. That's love. Love isn't something that you feel. Love, feelings are fine for when you're, you know, you're getting engaged. That's fine, whatever. Well, then after you've been married a little bit, you realize, man, oh man, those feelings are gone. Does that mean you're no longer in love? Did you fall out of love? No, you can't fall out of love. Love is an action. It's something that you intentionally put forth your, 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 your action to. It's the exact same thing with waiting on the Lord. It's something that I believe, and therefore I act. I believe, therefore I act. So waiting on the Lord is a two-part process. Trusting, that's the part he's going to do what he said he's going to do. Acting, that's I'm going to do what he told me to do. So how does this, how does this bring about a renewing? Well, I'm going to give you a couple a couple examples, but next week we're going to look a little bit more into this because it's, it would go too long if we tried to do this all in one week. Um, that's why I love series, guys. You can ramble for four times as long. What? I mean, man, that is a deal and a half. When Pastor said he wanted us to do series, I was like, man, I'm there. I'm there. I used to have to cut my sermons down from, you know, hour and a half long sermons. Now I don't have to. I just have to break them up into four sermons. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, anyways, um, so I do want to say this, though. It's not, it's not trying to do it ourselves, and it's not doing nothing. Okay? It's neither ends of the spectrum. It's not, I'm trying to do it myself. God, I don't need your help. I'm doing it myself. But neither is it not doing anything. There is, there is a middle ground there. God, I'm going to do what you told me to do, but I'm going to get my fingers out of that because you got that. Do you understand the difference? So here's a few examples before we scurry on out of here and eat like the cockroaches we are. Uh, first off, doubts will come. Doubts will come. That doesn't make you less of a Christian. It makes you alive. Doubts will come. When they do, cling to what God said. Cling to what God said. Because everything around you will change almost daily. Some things won't. Like, for instance, I, I'm going to give you a prophecy here. Somebody is going to post something stupid on Facebook tomorrow. Some things just don't change. But some things do change daily. Daily. Um, and so that brings the idea that we wear out, but God does not. God's word does not. Here's some more examples. If your family abandons you, if your spouse divorces you, if your plans and dreams fall apart, seek God. How, how do I seek God? Read his word, pray, meet together as a church, serve and love people. Don't live your life for yourself. And Pastor shared this this uh, this statistic a couple a couple months ago, and it's also in the new membership class. If you really want to see a change, you have to read your Bible four times per week, and that's going to church just once a week. You don't have to go to church all the time. Going to church one time a week, or reading your Bible four different days a week, four different days, and you'll start to see a change. 
See, the problem is that we don't want to give our time to God, but we want to have the results of having time with God. Well, that, that's just not going to work. I mean, it's just not going to work. You know what happens if Grace and I don't talk all week and then we get to Saturday? We feel real distant. Do you know why? Because we are. We didn't talk at all. Do you see what I mean? It's the same thing with God. I mean, it's not like, oh, you know, I, I, I never pray, God, but hey, could you just heap on a slew of blessings on me there? Uh, so, so some more examples. Um, when, you, when you don't see God working, when it looks like maybe God's forgotten you, when you don't know which way to turn, still holding on to God and acting how he wants you to act and speaking how he wants you to speak. Now, what does that mean? Well, he doesn't want you to lie. He doesn't want you to gossip and spread a bunch of nonsense to people. He doesn't want you to cheat on your wife. He doesn't want you to look at porn. I mean, we could keep going down the list, but you kind of get the idea. It's the idea that we worship even though you're struggling. It's praying. You know, people think I have to feel it all the time in order to worship God. That's just so wrong on so many different levels. It's just so incredibly wrong. I said it, I believe, in yams. I'm not sure. But I said worship that doesn't cost us anything is pointless. If you don't feel like worshiping and you worship anyways, that's giving God a worship that's a great sacrifice for you. See what I mean? It's a costly worship. Because you didn't feel like worshiping God, you did it anyways. When you have your act together and everything's going great, well, it's not that big of a sacrifice to praise God. It's really hard to praise God when your family starts dying, when everything starts to go wrong, when you're in bad health. It's really hard to praise God. But that's a, that's a costly sacrifice. That's something that God... That's something real. So through all of this, and we're going to build on this next week, it's the idea that it's not an event, it's a mindset. Waiting on the Lord isn't an event. Well, I woke up today, and you know what, God, I'm waiting on you. It's a mindset. It's a lifestyle. It's something where you make the decision to wait on the Lord, and then you act accordingly. You don't keep worrying about the nonsense. You don't keep bringing it up. You wait on the Lord. I wrote down that I wrote it on a slide, but it's not on a slide, so I guess I didn't do that. I'm a liar. I lied to myself. Uh, even if it doesn't seem like he can hear you, still pray. So God will answer in time. You wait on God, and he will give you new strength. What does that look like? Once again, you just keep seeking after God. You keep praying. You keep reading his word. You keep seeking after God, and eventually he will answer you. God can't stay. Here, here's a, I'm going to tell you something secret. This is God's secret hidden weakness. He can't stand to say no if you keep asking. If you just keep saying, God, I want more of you, he can't stand to hold himself away. He just He's waiting to bless you. If you keep nagging him and saying, God, I want more of you. I need more of you. I need you in my life. He'll answer you. It's his weakness. He can't say no for forever. He's too merciful. He's too good. He's too patient. He's too faithful. God can't act evilly. And if you just keep seeking him with your whole heart, he will answer you because he's promised that he would. He will never be a liar, never. That's right. Everything may die, but God's word will endure. And he said that he would answer, so he will. You just have to believe in the promise more than your own opinion. More than your own opinion. So next week we're gonna look, we're gonna kind of tie a nice little bow on that part, and then we'll end this series in two weeks. But next week, he will give you rest. It really is part two to this. So it's part, there's four parts. So this is part two of part four. And that's going to be part two of the semi of part four. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah. I'm trying to make it confusing. I'm totally joking. I'm totally, totally joking. Uh, but next week is part three of the finding true rest. Finding true rest. You know, we can have that rest. And it's called he will give you rest. Um, if I could have um, Anne closes in prayer, please.